no capes. So yeah, w welcome everyone to No Capes episode two. Uh, it's a new format, so there's going to be some teething problems for the first couple of episodes, especially with good old Australian NBN. Uh, but today I have Marwan with me from Egypt. It's crazy early in the morning Hi. for him. Uh, and we are talking about Chew. Or crazy late at night. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> we've got, we're talking about Chew, which is one of my favorite comics of all time. Um, it is balls to the wall bonkers from start to finish. Um, it's written by John Lehman with art by Rob Guillory. Uh, for the most part, John did the letters as well, I believe. And in later issues, they had a few other colorists, but, um, in early volumes, it was all drawn and colored by Rob. And Rob's style is really interesting and unique, and I dig it a lot. Uh, but before we get into it too much and do a full deep dive, uh, tell me about yourself a little bit, Mahan, and what you do over there. All right, so my name is Moron Amen. Uh, I started out as a comic artist, and then I've sort of branched out into doing multiple other things. Uh, right now, I'm a co-founder of uh, Peacecape, which is both an advertising company as well as a content creation company. We do, like, apart from the advertising, like, I, I direct uh, commercials and, like, copyright for them. It's sort of the main breadwinner, but we also have a YouTube channel where we have our own... Uh, comedy shows and we're sort of uh, on the rise thankfully in Egypt <laughs> unfortunately cool. all of our content is all of our content is in Arabic or else I could have asked you to check hey, it out <laughs> that's all right I want I am going to share it in the YouTube links anyway for anyone that might want to check it out that happens to speak Arabic because you never know yeah. I know I've got uh, family down in Sydney that do so um, you right. never know who yeah, that's great yeah um <laughs> who would enjoy it coincidentally and, uh, this is my yeah. second time collaborating with someone uh from egypt actually um this guy yeah. was 3d modeled by a freelance modeling guy based in cairo oh wow nice yeah um i he's That's he's really really good. really good i use him whenever i want to turn the, i'm stay sorry say again <laughs> No, I, he looks he looks like he's incredibly skilled. Like this is a fantastic model. Yeah, yeah, no, he's he's so good and he's really reasonably priced. I've got him to do a few models for me um whenever I've wanted to turn one of my paper miniatures into a 3D printable thing. Um I got him to do it and I love his work. So, it's always good for anyone watching to collaborate outside your usual circles cuz chances are you're going to find someone amazing. <laughs> No, I completely agree. Um, yeah, so that's that's cool. At the end, I'll get you to give us a bit of a more detailed plug about where everyone can find you as well, and I'll link all of that sure. in the YouTube sure. comments for people watching this after yeah. the stream. Um, but yeah, chew. Yeah, that'll, be, that'll be great. It has been a while since I read this from cover to cover. But Same here, so we'll be... F remembering it from from the distant memory <laughs> yeah yeah i'm gonna and I go, well, i'll flick through it while we talk but it's <laughs> it's something special like every so Absolutely. often like you come across a story that just stays with you yeah i i completely agree like with chew in particular like from the moment you open it it's First of all, Rob Rob Guillory's art is like nothing I've seen before. Like it's very unique and very special, and yeah. and that sort of captures your attention from the first page. Like the characters that like they look weird. The anatomy is all different, and it, it has its own rules and everything in how every character looks. And then so that sort of catches your eye, and then you start reading, and it just keeps getting weirder and weirder. In, in a good way, like the good kind of weird, like the yeah. weird you would enjoy pretty much. Yeah, and, and it's like... And it just doesn't stop getting crazy. Exactly. And like the <laughs> the rules that you say there, um, like it's very clear that Rob has a really solid grasp of anatomy and like knows how everything works to break those right. rules. 
Like, and, he created his own version of anatomy that just works. Yeah, because... And, like, and, it, and it's his own. Exactly. Because sometimes people try to do that and it doesn't work out because... Like, I would not try to do that yet. I would not try to stylize this right. hard because... I don't feel like I've got that grip on anatomy to try to do that consistently in a way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But right. when you see something like this, you can see that no, this guy knows what he's doing and he's just created his right. own visual language. Absolutely. And, and honestly, like one of the things I actually liked is like, he seems to have a really solid grasp on it from the first issue. Mm -hmm. But then the more you read on, like, the more you see him develop as an artist. Oh, like, yeah. It's clear, like, he's not sticking to the older style just to maintain consistency. Like, the better he gets, the more he applies it to his work. And and you yep. can see the work evolve as, as it moves forward. Exactly. I'm which looking is, at... Which is something that you rarely see. Ex yeah, that's yeah, no, exactly right. I'm looking at issue uh, volume one right now uh, and comparing it to um, Farmhand, his current ongoing series. Right. And, like, this, you can see that it's the same artist, but looking at the farmhand work, you can see how far he's evolved since Chew. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and if you haven't read that, um, I really recommend checking it out on Comixology because uh, it's also balls to the wall insane. Uh, is it also written by... Uh, no, it's written and drawn by Rob. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Now I have to check. Now I have and, to see. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm sure Rob added a lot to this because a lot of the storytelling in Chew is visual, so I can't wait to see what he wrote. In yeah, Batman. it's it's really cool. It's uh, just the basic story is there's this guy who's discovered some kind of seed that he calls the Jebediah Seed. That's his name. Mm -hmm. um, and he starts growing on a farm and ends up creating this, this whole facility that's farming replacement body parts for people. Like, wow. literal okay. arms growing <laughs> on trees and flowers that grow eyeballs and stuff like that. And, like, tomato plants that are actually Shit. kidneys. <laughs> and then also goes into the story of how that could possibly go wrong. And there's some... Well, yeah, because... Yeah. There's some, like... Because it has to go wrong. Exactly. And there's some hints and <laughs> subtle nods that there's some weird eldritch business going on. Ah, okay. I, I, I don't know what it is yet. Um, I'm waiting for the next few <laughs> issues to finally get, like, the big reveals happening. Nice. But there's about 10 or 12 issues out now, so it's a, there's enough to read. Okay. Whereas... I think that's about one trade. Like, that's... Yeah. Like, ten, ten issues of the trade yet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and it got picked up for a series, too, actually. Apparently. Oh, like a TV series. Nice. Yeah, not sure if it's live I action or animated. would get picked up. Right? This would be crazy. Like, like I even have, like, the casting in... My, like, the main character, Tony Chu, mm -hmm. should definitely be played by John Cho. You know John Cho? Oh, see? Yes. Yes. Also, though... Also a good possibility, Osric Chow. I don't think I know him. Um, have you seen Supernatural? Um, uh, no, I have not. Have you seen Dirk Gently? Yes. Vogel. I have seen Dirk Gently. From oh, the Rowdy right. Three. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, Osric yeah, Chow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was also um, nice. Ryan Choi in the Arrow crossover most recently. I've I've not caught up to Arrow. I've, I've I've been a little bit behind in Arrow, so yeah. Cool. Well, uh, Ryan Choi. Well, no, I remember from the Ready Three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that guy. Uh, Osric Choi. Wait, I can I can look it up right now. <laughs> he's he's a really interesting actor, and he's a really nice guy actually. Um, I met him okay. at a convention last year. Yeah, last year. Oh, okay, yeah, now I remember. Um. But yeah, I met him at a local convention last year. He's a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. um, and he is also a martial artist, so... Like... Yeah, so that would be great. Yeah. So, we agree. Osric Chow, if it gets picked up for a TV series, and John Cho, if it gets picked up for a movie. Yeah, that would be cool. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, I, and you know, I could I could interchange either of them for either of those positions. You know, they're like they're both right. equally good to me for different reasons. Right. Uh, because like John is also a martial artist and a pop star. Yeah. Is he a pop star? I, yeah. I yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes by J. Only known from the films. He goes by J. Chow in China. But um, wow, okay. he's like full on crazy auditoriums filled, popular in China. Um, I used to make lightsabers and worked with a factory in China. And then one day they sent me some photos of John in this crazy Tron suit with a bunch of other dudes in crazy Tron suits using the lightsabers <laughs> from their factory in their dance performances <laughs> at this pop concert that he was doing. Wow. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to check that out. After yeah, so like outside like, of Hollywood. Send me a link. Send me a link to that. Yeah, I will. No, He's no, a no, massively no, successful no. pop star. Oh, damn. <laughs> he just doesn't perform I in was not expecting the that. US. No, I, I know. It probably doesn't make sense there. Like, yeah. The fan base is very different. Yeah, but yeah, in China, he's gigantic. Wow, okay. Yeah, so either of those guys would be a perfect Tony Chu. Yeah. And and honestly, like, I was, I was flipping through the first couple of issues that I've read uh, for Chu, and it makes weird sense how, like the opening story at least in the first issue mirrors like what we're going through right now because like the world of chu exists in a sort of post pandemic world but yeah. that pandemic was the chicken was the chicken flu yeah like, remember when the chicken flu was like this whole big thing and this world imagine like if chicken flu continued to become like this big pandemic and like we're looking through it now i'm like we're going through a pandemic right now it's not chicken flu but like i'd hate to imagine what the world would come out of this one yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I mean, we haven't uh, I think we should introduce what Chu is about yeah no exactly so far we're just raving about how much we like it but we should actually talk about it um, exactly uh, you go ahead actually alright so uh, Chu exists in a world in a post in a post chicken flu pandemic world where basically eating chicken and poultry has been prohibited and we start off with uh, Tony Chu and his partner. I forget his partner's name right now. Who are cops? Like they work for the Vice Squad. And they're sort of arresting people for eating chicken, pretty much. Like, John think of Colby. It as prohibition, like back when John Colby. Yes. Yeah. Uh, think of it as basically prohibition, like when prohibition was in the U.S., where they, where like alcohol was illegal, but instead of alcohol, it's chicken. Yeah. But the twist is uh, Tony Chu is. Uh, I read it chibopathic. I don't know how it's... Uh, is it Cibopath. I was just looking it up before we started. <laughs> I always pronounce it chibopath, but yeah, C he's a chibopath, which means that if he eats something, he can basically see everything that this, whatever he ate, has gone through. So if he eats an apple, he sees the tree he grew up on, he sees the pesticide that was sprayed on it. And yeah. like to quote the book, if he eats a, a burger, he sees something a whole lot different. Which yeah, is pretty much it's, like, whatever um, that cow has gone through. Yeah, it's basically tactile <laughs> telepathy, but only when he eats something. Exactly. And uh, and then the story sort of goes on to like the first story that introduces the character goes on to him trying to solve a murder. Yes. Or a series of murders, and like this is this is when the story gets incredibly crazy because like he corners the killer. I'm not gonna spoil who the killer or what the killer is. But he corners the killer, and uh, the killer refuses to talk, and instead kills himself. Yeah. And this is where, this is where, when you're reading, you realize, oh fuck, this is not like anything I've ever read, because Tony Chu, the main character, just kneels down to the ground and bites into his corpse. Yeah, yeah, he takes a chomp. Yeah. <laughs> just and and at this moment, you're like. Okay, this is like nothing I've ever seen before, <laughs> and it just it keeps sort of upping the crazy oh, issue by issue, and you think they've gone far, and it just keeps getting right more and more. I literally yeah. just <laughs> flicked to that page by accident. 
Right. Like I was just like flipping you don't through that page. No, and I'm I'm on that page right now, and I kind of forgot about how dramatic it was, and yeah, the light, the lighting that they used in yeah. the art, and yeah, Rob's use of screen tones and either like solid black backgrounds or solid white backgrounds and stuff just really adds to the drama of this yeah, no. scene. And, and, and Rob's like, cause his art style is not realistic. Like his art style is clearly cartoony. Yeah. But it, 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 it sort of walks that fine line of being cartoony and sort of humorous, but at the same time, incredibly gruesome. Yeah. I'm just showing exactly. yeah some of it to the camera. Yeah. And like it, the drama is there, and yeah, it is. It's very cartoony, but you feel the weight of what's going on. Exactly, and I think it's that balance that makes the entire story palatable. To right, and I like intended. <laughs> I love it because it's such a contrast. Like it, it's simul simultaneously a contrast and the perfect fit for the story they're telling. Right, because for the comedic moments, the story's very dark. Yeah. It's, it's very dark, so the contrast to the dark moments is just really strong, and it makes the story hit home. But also, it's very comedic, and the cartooniness Absolutely. and the expressions that Rob it draws are... Um... They're, they're a perfect fit. I mean, because, because you go on afterwards to see, like, genetically engineered frogs that taste like chicken <laughs> and... Chugs! <laughs> Yes, chugs are. I think they're also called frickens. Like I, I don't yeah. think they've ever like agreed to how. <laughs> well, later in the book, and they also, think they tend to stay stick with they chugs. They call them chugs. Yeah. And yeah. um, what did they end up with? There was like, I think there was even chows at one point. They started getting really exotic with it and breeding chugs with other animals. Ah, oh, okay. I don't think I've come across these ones yet. <laughs> yeah, it gets really, I, really I strange. Put it past them. Yeah. And, and and let's not forget P Poyo, like yes. the fan favorite that got his own spin-off. Yes, <laughs> the secret agent, like, yes. fighting rooster. <laughs> uh, I guess he if they've got. I can't remember if Volume One has any Poyo posters in it, or if it's later. No, I think Poyo appears around two or three. Yeah, where's two? I've got it here somewhere. I've got to find one of the Poyo posters. Every time they intro, they talk about Poyo, and someone's like, "Where's Poyo?" They There's flash a up a full splash page B B movie monster movie poster of what <laughs> Poyo is currently doing, and they're brilliant and they get really weird. Um, yeah, I mean he's a, he's a he's a brutal fighting chicken secret agent. <laughs> yeah, um, and then there's that whole thing where you know. They're trying to search for I the think perfect. He becomes a cyborg at one point. Yes, Cyber Poyo. Yeah. Um. Like. Um. There's that thing where they're trying to find that perfect alternative to chicken, and they all start looking into this gulsa berry thing, which apparently tastes yeah, exactly weird... like chicken. The... Yeah, it's a pineapple with tentacles. Yeah, it's like this weird <laughs> alien weird? fruit. That, yeah, looks kind of like a pineapple with some weird tentacle bits. <laughs> and these are just the mild stuff. Like, it gets even crazier than that. And 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 the, and the thing is, like, we're talking about the absurd and outlandish parts of it. But I think what grounds it all is, is how the characters are really well drawn out and they're incredibly human. Like, like you still go through, you still see the struggles of, of Tony trying to live with... His condition, like, because it seems like a superpower, like being uh, uh, cibopathic, but it is it is more of a an ailment from his point of view. Like, yeah, he literally can't eat anything except beets, and he yeah. can't enjoy food. And like, he finds this other uh, like differently powered tele telepathic person. She, the way she, when she writes about yes. food, you can literally taste it. Yep. And, yeah, I and, love like, the her. The world has a lot of different powered people with food. Pretty yeah, much. Like, uh, yeah. All the superpowers are food related. Yeah. yeah. The only superpowers that exist in this world are based around food. Are food. And yeah. I love her story, her introduction. She was a oh, she's food critic. 
So she can write about food and tell you about the meals that she's tried and you can taste it. So one day she gets bored and deliberately starts going around and trying all the worst rated restaurants in the city. <laughs> and starts giving people food poisoning through her articles. <laughs> through her writing, yeah. Fantastic. Um, I can't... So, I mean, like... Here is Poyo. Uh, I don't think it shows the light earth is reflecting. Oh, it, it's on the, um, on the stream camera, it's good. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, a few pages later is like the first introduction to um, Poyo's special title font. Nice. Uh, but yeah, he doesn't get any of the posters in volume two either. So it mustn't be till <laughs> volume three. Like honestly, with that title font that appears with Poyo, I, like, I keep imagining like mariachi music playing. Yeah. In the background well, that's it. Then like, they do. find him. He's wearing a luchador mask because he was fighting in a underground chicken and, uh, luchador ring cockfighting man yeah <laughs> um but it's yeah the the posters are perfect i think the my favorite one still was um poyo versus the quacken nice and it's just yeah this the weird quack. duck octopus cthulhu monster <laughs> um and, and, uh, yeah, no, it's it's that it's it's the the, ba the balance in Chew is like laughing at Poyo versus the Quack, and then in the following page, it's it's Chew eating a chopped off finger to try to save like a kidnapped person or, yeah. or the other. Or and then a few more pages later, person. it's Poyo murdering an entire room of bad guys with his chicken claws, very brutally. Right. And it just it keeps going up and down, up and down with tone, and I, I think I think it's pretty well balanced in how it sort of goes around it, and and the way it also deals with like all the like how sort of the the writing sort of balances out the the rules of the powers. Yeah. Like, because Tony's not the only one with these powers, but the way other people deal with it is very very differently. Like there's this one guy who has this power who files his teeth to be like yes the vampire only consumes blood yeah he's basically a vampire <laughs> yeah and uh, he, he just leaned into it he's like fuck it i'm a vampire now yeah and there's savoy <laughs> yeah yeah he Mason has savoy. i can't remember if does he have the power that tony has or does he just know he about it no 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 he has the power yeah i thought he did yeah he's got this... he, he uses it yeah he he uses it. Uh, bec uh, I don't know how far we should spoil, but <laughs> when yeah. like because he works with Tony uh, in the FDA, uh, and he sort of uses the power as well. Yeah. Uh, well, let's just do but let's I just do a quick he warning uses here. It slightly differently. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just do a quick warning <laughs> here for anyone tuning in at this point. From here out, there may be spoilers. Chew has been out for quite a while now, so. We're not going to go into any, years. like, hardcore spoilers, necessarily. Right. But if you haven't read it yet, be... there, there might be some spoilers. Because the entire series has been out in trades for a little while. Um, and it's a really good comic, and we're obviously both really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I think the way Mason sort of does his power is, like... Yeah, like I remember how it's drawn. Like he would get all these like little squares with everything that sort of happened. Yeah, that's right. Focus in on the tiny bit. Yeah, because he's how he kidnapped Shu's daughter. That's right, because he's leaned into it and trained right. with his powers. Whereas exactly. Chu uses it, but generally he eats beets all the time, so he doesn't have to deal with it. Yeah. Whereas Savoy so Chu hates his power. Yeah, and Savoy embraces Savoy it. Savoy leans into him. Yeah. Savoy embraces it to the point that I think when they had a falling out was because Savoy embraced it too much that he was seeking out exotic meats and exotic animals yes. to eat so he yeah. could get that experience. Yeah, he was yeah, and like like, uh, like a saber, like frozen saber tooth steak yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, they were finding <laughs> like rich elite exotic restaurants where they were, yeah, they had like dinosaur meat and shit that they'd found frozen in the Antarctic and. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. 
and then and then and then it go, goes into aliens and it goes in, it just keeps going up and down and and, and deeper and right uh, then there's like the people that can make weapons like there's that one guy who was a chef who can make razor sharp weapons out of tortillas i don't think i come across them oh or i don't remember i'm not yeah sure. it's just in, like in sure. one of the places that they raid there's this guy and he makes knives and throwing stars and stuff out of tortillas <laughs> wow <laughs> um and then it turns out that Chu's daughter that... has power as well did you read that far i remember that i don't remember what i think i remember she has a power i don't remember what the power was though she makes weapons out because of chocolate a while, a while oh okay yeah but she can make any weapon mm -hmm. out of chocolate not just knives yeah, she can make a like a she can like make a fully gun. working That's automatic true. machine gun out of chocolate nice <laughs> And, like, explosives and stuff. And I think she had another friend that can do stuff with carrots. I can't remember what she does with the carrots. But she does... <laughs> her power is specifically carrots. Um, and then there's the... It's, the... Crazy. it's crazy how they, they, they put a rule for them so like all superpowers have to have food in them. Yes. And they just went crazy with that. Yeah. Yeah. I there's... remember there was one guy who had a boring uh, food telepathy power which yeah whenever he ate something it could just recite the ingredients yes that's right like down to the chemicals yes but then they actually needed him because they were trying to find out what was in something and they oh, really? need to know immediately I... you know they didn't have time ah. for the lab to do tests so they <laughs> made this yeah, guy yeah. eat it <laughs> nice. um and then there's those the guys that um get super strength one gets super strength from carrots and one gets super strength from beets. I don't think I've seen... Uh, no, I don't think I've come across them yet. Oh, okay, yeah. No, the <laughs> two... Further than I've Tony yeah. has to fight those guys at one point. Nice. I think you then might not have seen the final evolution of Tony's powers then. I have not, no. Okay, I'm not going to tell you about that because not. it's really <laughs> exciting once you realise, but... Tony eventually figures out that right. seeing the memories of things is not the only thing he can do with his powers. Oh. Especially once okay. he starts fucking with the Gulsa Berries. Okay, the the alien, the alien fruits. Mm hmm It gets real yeah. freaky once he starts eating those. Alright, cool. Well, I look forward to, to catching up on the story then. Yeah. Uh, do you know about um, yeah, his true. partner and their boss? Uh, no. Like, I know about his partner, I know about his boss. Are they... Is there something more to them there's a, there's There's more to them together, and then there's more to them and the boss of the FDA together. Uh, you know, like the, no, ang I... the angry lady that runs the FDA? When they all get the cybernetics and stuff? That. Yeah, yeah. Like I know his partner gets he gets cybernetics pretty early on. Yeah, he gets cybernetics in his oh, face. Yeah, he gets, and he the gets, lady that yeah. runs that department, um, right? She plays a bigger part later as well. Okay, yeah. I think where I'm at, there's still a guy running that department, not a lady. Um, uh, they get the they get transferred ran... to a different department because there's the big guy right. that is their boss okay. of their main department. And then they right, get yeah. transferred into the department that partners them up with animals. I, yeah, I think that's the USDA. Like, they had all the women with yes, the birds. Like yeah, the had a, yeah, I'm looking at that now, the USDA. Yeah, USDA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, when... I, I remember I came across them when I was refreshing my memory, like when I was sort of flipping through and refreshing my memory of uh, what was happening, but I don't remember their storyline. Like, I remember there was, like, this elite team of women with birds... Yeah, and like one had a lion. I don't remember what. Yeah, <laughs> like they, they have to be partnered with animals. Like this, yeah. this part I remember. Um, and you know the guy with the afro? Um, I can't remember his. I remember him, but I don't remember. Not remember not D Bear. Yeah, not, no, I remember them. Not the criminal, the agent. No, no, not D Bear from the first. No, 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 no. There was an agent with an afro. He looked like. Uh, Sort of Samuel L. Jackson yeah. from Pulp Fiction. Yeah, he was apparently he was mm. like he was a deliberate nod to that guy, but I can't remember his name right now. Um, he okay. gets cybernetics no, eventually as well. I think what one of the one of the like bonus covers was uh, 
was uh, Chu and Mason dressed up like uh, Pulp Fiction. Oh, nice. Like with the guns and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he ends up getting injured on, on a mission and ends up with... Uh, with cybernetics. Cybernetics as well. and But then so does the boss. Okay. And the bosses... Their boss from the FBI. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And his, his cybernetics take an interesting turn. Okay, I definitely did not, did not reach that part. But yeah, doesn't uh, doesn't go where you expect. You could you could. Sp- All right, I think you could spoil that bit. Um, <laughs> I feel you want to talk about it more. Oh well, yeah, the the agent. Um, right. Uh, hang on, I forgot his name here. No, it doesn't have his name. Colby. <laughs> no, no, the other guy that with the afro. He ends up with um. Okay, no, I don't remember. A big gigantic crab claw. Okay. For a hand. <laughs> All right. Um, That's an interesting choice for a cybernetic arm, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then Appleby, the boss, um, right. when he gets hurt, he loses his legs. So he gets crab legs? He, well, he gets multiple sets of legs across the rest of the series. But I think it's... Oh, so they keep changing everything. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it only changes twice from memory. Nice. But one is actually a set of crab legs. And the other is a centaur. And... Centaur. Okay. So like, he's like... like half horse. Like yeah, horse. he gets it gets horse, horse body. Horse body. <laughs> but yeah, so he's like... Why not? Because, yeah. Yeah, he's still human from... But he gets turned into a centaur. From the top... And then later gets turned into um, Caesar. Caesar, that's the one. Caesar. That's the other agent, I think. Oh, yeah. I think that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just reading the blurb about Tony. um, Mm. The sister. Right. Yeah. Um, That was also a nice joke, how, like, like his twin sister is also called Tony, which is spelled differently. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And Chow, uh, Chow Chu is their brother. Yeah, Chow Chu. Yeah. Who's a chef. Yes. A chef named, a chef, a chef named Chow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh uh, man, that just reminded me of something. Oh, boy. I can't tell you about that. You have to find out about that on your own. But all, right, all right, sounds good. There's something sort of devastating related to Chow later in the series okay chow's okay but the thing that has to do with chow is kind of devastating well okay yeah i just all right i just had a like it just gave me a flashback (laughs) okay it's that all right all right (laughs) i can i can imagine how how dark that that book goes so yeah, look and, for it to be as shocked as you are. And it was, again, it was one of those things where it was super dark and upsetting, but at the same time, mm. really comical. Yeah. And yeah, so, that, like, you bad. felt bad for laughing at it, but that was the point. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, from the very first time Chow appears, he's kind of a... Like, it, it seems like the writers, like, the creators hate him. Like, because, like, Tony wants to put him in jail. Yeah. Like, the moment he sees him. Like, he doesn't even care. Yeah, Chow is kind of the the douchebag the weasel of, of the family. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like. And and this, like, the whole family is exactly what I'm talking about. And how the stories are sort of grounded in, in, in heart. And, mm. like his his sort of relationship with his sister with his estranged daughter with his brother with his parents like this whole dynamic is very very human and is very very sort of like grounded in reality that it makes all the other fantastical stuff sort of work right because like the human connections and the characters and how they're drawn and and all their relationships they're just incredibly incredibly well drawn out they they really are and of course there's the sequel Chew, not Chew, just Chew, the, like their last name, which yeah. is Tony's right. spin-off series. She gets her own series. Uh, 
Yeah, I think I saw covers for that, but I don't think I haven't read it. But yeah, uh, only issue one is out, I think, so far. Um, I picked it up okay. on Col- Comicsology a couple of weeks ago. It's really yeah. good already. It's sort of a prequel. All right, nice. Ah, uh, so sort of how they got to that point, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of her story, and it, you know, it, um, you know, right at the start of Chew, where he goes home for like family Thanksgiving or something. Right. Yeah. And like she walks in halfway through the day and everyone's like giving her the cold shoulder. So issue one tells the story of what she was up to up until that moment where she walks in the door for that Thanksgiving. Nice. So it looks like it's going to be the story of her adventures during all the events that unfold. Oh, okay. Nice. Because it turns out she's actually got a really extensive secret life. (laughs) Doesn't she work at NASA? Uh, hang on. It, I thought that was... I remember she's wearing a NASA shirt. I think that might be a lie. Hang on, let me have a look here. <laughs> oh, she does it at one point. Oh, man. It's complicated now. Because I remember, like, during that family Thanksgiving, she's wearing a purple NASA shirt. Yeah, I think... Oh, wait. No, I remember now. Yeah, no, there's there's more to it. Yeah, I remember okay. that she... Yeah, she was NASA. <laughs> and then I just remembered something from her comic. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, right. that makes sense now. Something just clicked for me because <laughs> I remembered her story from this comic. Right. Um. Yeah, but it turns out, like, she's actually got a way more extensive secret life about her work with NASA than anyone is aware of nice well yeah (laughs) yeah um i love it i love it when stories tend to do that like like oh you thought you knew how the story went well let's let's dig like when the when it's done right like sometimes it's done just in a sort of fan servicey way like this one's clearly thought out like Yes. Let's tell a good story yeah. out of it. There was mm-hmm. another story I read recently. I'm going to have to try to figure out what it is and cover it on another episode. That was that. It was like right. multiple simultaneous threads of all of the different characters and then how they came to be together in the present. And it's like it, it opens right. up with like mid mission or mid adventure. And everyone's doing a right. thing, and you sort of get a feeling, and you think you know what's going on. And then, right. as the story progresses, and we start getting flashbacks into their backstory. How everyone got, got to that point. Yeah, right. and it turns out that actually, no, it's it's completely different. And the people you thought were the good guys aren't necessarily the good guys. Uh, and the people that are the bad guys are bad guys, but they're not necessarily the bad guys. Uh. And stuff like that. Wait, what, 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 what story is that? I can't remember. Wait. This oh, is okay. the, this is the ADHD curse. I remember that I read the right, a really yeah, yeah. good story with threads like that, but I can't remember what exactly. book it is. And I'm going to have to like yeah. flick through everything I've got on the shelf and see if it's here. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise maybe you've read it ages ago and, and it's like, or, or are you sure you read it recently? Yeah. It might just be something you read a long time ago. Yeah, it could be. It could be something I've got on the shelf here. It could be something <laughs> I read on Comixology forever ago. Right, I, yeah. But that, like, as soon as you mention that, I get flashes of, yeah, no, I know that that thing. I've got a story that the feeling of the story has stuck with me. No, I know exact. I know exactly what you mean, and it's incredibly frustrating. Like trying to rack your brain, trying to remember. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> e- exactly. Like you remember, like yes, that was great. That was fantastic. That was, and like maybe even like you would incorporate it in your work, and like you wouldn't notice, like oh, and then someone would mention, like oh yeah, that's that's the thing that I'm sort of referencing that I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's actually it's really funny with that. Um, I came up with this design for a uni assignment for a comic that i'm working on last year um as soon as i finished it i was like i I just did it for the assignment we had to come up with a a painting based off a collage Mm. and then as soon as i finished it i was like no i have to write something about this this needs to be something but everyone that saw it thought i was inspired by saga 
Ah, okay. And I was like, well, I can see how you think that. And then I was like, no, there's actually something, it was something else. It was something else, something else, something else. And a while, it took me a while, I figured out there's this animation, like anime movie called Dead Leaves. Okay. Yeah. And it, it was that. Um, let me just see. I'll p- turn that up for the Twitch stream so they can see it. Uh, can you see, as I tilt that back, that orange poster on the wall? Yeah. It was, it's that guy. That's the one? Um, okay. <sighs> this is the actual assignment piece. Oh, nice. Oh yeah, I can see how like uh, they, they like Saga was brought up in that one. Yeah, yeah cuz like Saga was the was, the current yeah. big popular thing that had that sort of visual the TV head, yeah. Yeah, in it. And um, yeah. like I love Saga. I've got it on the shelf back here too. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't no, the I thing love Saga too. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't the thing that triggered no, that. I understand. It was the memories of this crazy anime movie. It's called De- uh, Dead Leaves? Yeah. I can't really remember yeah. a lot because of it. Because I remember, like, an- another anime also had that kind of robot oh, yeah, yeah. character with a TV for a head. FLCL, if you've ever heard Oh, yeah, it. somebody mm-hmm. mentioned that to me recently when they saw that art. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it, yeah. but I know it exists. Um, if, if you want to watch it, watch the older uh, anime, because I think it got remade, and I heard that the remake wasn't that good. Okay. So watch the original one, which was made, like, earlier in the, I think, in the 90s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll check that out. Um, yeah, it's and... only six episodes. It's, it's really easy to go through. Yeah. It's it's really just really interesting how something, like, so far back mm-hmm. can have such a subconscious effect on you and your work. No. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like it was, it would have been more I've than ten a, years ago. Funnier. Sorry, I've had a, I've had a funnier story with uh, also a uni assignment. Uh, my graduation project, like I was, like I attempted to do like a forty-page graphic novel. Like that mm-hmm. was sort of a, like I decided this is gonna be my graduation project. For, I was, I double majored in art and mechanical engineering, so my yep. art graduation project was that, and I based it off, uh, I based it off. Uh, like local folklore, like uh, I'm sure you know Aladdin. Like aside yeah, yeah, from yeah. Aladdin, uh, or like in the longer story of Aladdin, there's there's not just the lamp that grants wishes. There's also the ring of Solomon oh, that yeah. had a different genie that only gave him like one one wish. But then there's another folklore character in Egypt called uh, Shot al Hassan or like Hassan the Cunning, who all his adventures revolve around just just that ring. And then there's there's also a couple of he saves the princess and, and all that. And the thing is, the ring has a genie that grants him a wish. Yeah. And sort of the... the uh, My sort of graphic novel, sort of a modernization of that, where the ring would give him powers. Yeah. Uh, but then, like, the way I've set it up is that sort of the worlds of the, 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 the jinn and humans have sort of collided. So he doesn't have to make the wish, but just imagine what he wants and the ring will make it happen the thing is after i'm done it looked exactly like green lantern but i've never read green lantern up until that point yeah like i read green lantern like a couple of years after and i was like wait a minute that's exactly what i did two years ago <laughs> and i had no idea what green lantern was about yeah <laughs> and it's just i've basically created green lantern but from a different origin and yeah, that's <laughs> that's happened to me a couple of times as well. Like I've I've drawn something mm-hmm. or I've told someone about an idea that I was thinking about turning into something and they're like, "Oh, that sounds like this 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 and this. Is that what inspired you?" Or did you base that off this? So I'm like, "What is that?" <laughs> what is that? Seriously. Exactly. And I look it up <laughs> and it's actually almost identical. But I've never heard of it, never seen it, never come across it at all. It's but it's, it's it's insane, and it's one of the reasons why I, I say to people a lot, you know, like, don't worry about if your idea is similar to somebody else's, because no, I agree. Things like this can happen in a complete vacuum, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You can create the exact same thing as somebody else without ever having known that person or seen their work. And 
it's just it's gonna happen it's because there's just so many similar stories in every culture and every civilization that are ingrained in us exactly different you know told in different ways slightly different things here and there but all of those stories are every always around and you may not remember that you've even heard any of those stories so they will that they, they will influence you and then you will end up creating something similar to what someone else has done because they were influenced by their version of the same stories exactly no absolutely i absolutely agree i honestly like i think like humans have been on this earth for thousands of years like every single idea you can think of has probably been thought of twice like this yeah. is this is my theory like this is <laughs> I, I feel cool. like these days if you're telling a story innovation not originality is the key because again yeah, which is why yeah. like it, like we bring it we bring it full circle with chew like which is why like Chu is incredibly amazing because the way they sort of innovate with like telep te telepathic superpowers and and intrigue and, and all these other crazy stuff to create such a what one could call an original work yeah. is fantastic. Like the way they've sort of molded exactly. everything into this like, insane thing that you've just never seen before. Yeah, a, a lot of the tropes and story elements and stuff like that have been present in other works like, you know, the the buddy cop thing and the sudden betrayal from someone within the department or oh it turns out that that person you've known your entire life has a secret life and you don't actually know them at all but the way they've combined all of those elements and spun it into this new weird take on things has created something original and new but the exactly the elements themselves and a lot of parts of the story aren't original but the way they tell it no, absolutely the way they tell it is original and that's what you have to focus on exactly like 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 they take take one element for instance like the vampire yeah like everyone knows what a vampire is but then they take okay so we have this thing that exists that is vampires and we have a world where people have telepathic ability with food how can we put this into that? And then they've created their vampire character, which is unlike any vampire you've seen before. Yeah, exactly. And everything sort of makes sense within, like, and yep. the, and it's and and they keep they keep doing it. Like like we've seen secret agents, we've seen aliens, we've seen sort of all of, all the all the tropes, but it just they they put it in, put a spit on it, they take it, they put a spit on it, and and to the point that it's exactly like i think the best analogy is rob Giller, guillory's art uh in yeah. itself in which we know how anatomy works he's just taken that and put his own spin on how anatomy works and that's how we draw that's his style yeah i have done the same with the story pretty much yeah exactly and there are so many archetypes present in this story but they're also they're present on purpose right yeah and they're present on purpose that they and they then they twist them into something new and different and, and it's they're present on purpose because they're easy shortcuts to they're easy storytelling shortcuts like they, they get you to they want to get you to this point so they can tell their story better so they don't have to explain a lot exactly before you get to the interesting part exactly yeah like tropes and archetypes aren't always a bad thing so don't be worried about using them just make sure you're using the right ones and for the right reasons you know like they exist for a reason because they are storytelling shorthand but you just got to make sure that you're not using tropes that are negative because that's not only offensive to people but it's also just bad storytelling yeah absolutely like negative tropes are negative for a reason and why would you want to have negative tropes in your work because then you just tell a story that's going to upset somebody yeah no absolutely i agree yeah cliches and tropes aren't bad using them lazily or without thought can make for a bad work but they aren't bad in themselves and new writers shouldn't be scared of them.
No. I've, like the the saying goes that cliches are cliches for a reason because there's an element of truth in the cliche and there's a difference between also like a cliche and a stereotype like mm. like a stereotype as you said can can be can be negative and and and, and can ha can, can come from a place of ignorance sometimes which is why we tend to avoid most stereotypes but but cliches that exist especially in storytelling tropes uh they exist because there's an element of truth within them and the trick to writing is to find the element of truth and sort of expanding on that or elaborating on that in a, in a way that has not been done before or or just in a way that's truthful and not just using the cliche as you said in a, in a sort of lazy manner like like that's how like just put the cliche for the sake of like, exactly uh, lazily getting the story told no but you know there are certain things that you need those shortcuts to be able to tell the story efficiently. And right. that's what that's why those things exist. Um, to quote the office, why use lot word when some word will do? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, you don't like <gasps> No, like, absolutely. I think you saw the the episode we did last week, for example, like that story was only 44 pages long. Mhm. Mm and it was so full. So don't be afraid of visual shorthand, visual tropes, writing tropes, you know, cliches. Just use them in effective and innovative ways to tell your story. Because exactly. if a 44-page yeah. story with less than five panels per page can feel like a rich and immersive world, then, you know, anything can, as long as you put that no, effort into absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, single issues are even less than that. Like, they're 24 yeah. pages, and sometimes they tell whole stories. Like, Ex yeah, exactly. A 24-page comic is a solid episode. Like, you can tell a story from start to finish. Exactly. Um, the, with that, that TV-headed guy, um, I'm doing that as an anthology, not a, a GN. So, like, right. each story is going to be a maximum of 10 pages. Wow. Okay. Like short so you can still stories. Tell a full st yeah. Yeah. Just like. And, and this is one of the things I love about comics. Like, like, the length of the story can vary, but it, they all still work. Like a lot of actually, a lot of the the solid comic work that I've read, it has actually been short stories. Like, like a lot of the, like I started like younger, I would read a lot of the Disney sort of uh, like Ducktales stuff uh, comics, and these are oh, these tend to be really short. Like these tend to be. <laughs> these tend to be like 10 to 15 pages and like yeah. the comic would be like 24 pages and have like three different stories yeah like the... and they would they would tell full adventures in 10 pages exactly the one that i'm working on right now um as part of my sequentials practice and stuff to develop my portfolio is only four mm -hmm. pages long right and the final page is like a full splash page with a single word on it right it's just like a black I, I, with a I, red I word, it's... and um, but so it's tech... so it's essentially three pages exactly. But it, I didn't write it. Um, the guy who wrote, um, she actually wrote it. Mm. I just hit him up one day and said, "Hey, do you have any like less than ten page scripts I can have a crack at?" Because uh, I'm trying to build up my sequentials practice before I start tackling my story. And um, right. he, he's like, "Yeah, here, here's one: the man who found the future." And it is, it's a whole thing in three pages. So I just, I just hope that I can do it justice because reading the script, you know, there's like between four to six pages, uh, some panels per page. Right. I think the set, the second page is only three panels, I think, uh, from memory. Wow. Um, and there's one or two caption boxes per panel max just very short ones and efficient um, economic stories <laughs> yeah it's it's it really hits like i read it and i was like damn this is actually really heavy for three pages no absolutely no i can uh that you reminded me of this uh this egyptian comic artist named uh muhammad salah he did he did this post-apocalyptic comic that does a lot of 
heavy world building and an interesting story between two characters in one page. Nice. Just one page of a guy and a girl trying to go on a date during a sort of post-apocalyptic world, but and with very minimal work, like I think it, it's all like six panels or maybe less. Yeah. But it, it tells a whole story. Like you, like within within this page, you know exactly what the world has been through, like how the world is right now, and how people are living, and how they're like there's different factions doing different things all around everything, and and it's just one page of a guy and a girl going on a date during that, and it's just. And like they're not even talking about the world around them. Like, this is all inferred from just the visual and the stuff, and it's all one page. That's... And it's stuff like this that's just impressive about that medium. Yeah, that that's really cool, and that's that's why I really hope I can do this one justice for Ryan because mm. it's just reading the story. Like, really, I could feel it. So I'm hoping that yeah. my my work will also portray that. Um, yeah. Oh, I can't wait to see what you're doing. We're done with yeah, I'm, I'm like literally going to be working on it this afternoon on my, my next stream, actually. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> I've done the cover completely. Um, I did. I actually started it last year, but then uni started. Ah, okay. And so it was like, okay, you go on the shelf. And then I finished <laughs> uni, and I've had to catch up on a few other things through the start of this year. And the worst part was towards the end of last year, I had a, a tablet crash. Uh, on my Samsung tablet sorry. and I lost the layered file but thankfully oh. because I'm ADHD yeah. and I get excited about my stuff I've been sending Ryan screenshots every time I finish some new stuff on the page right so, so I was able to so grab the screenshots and throw them into a new file and trace over it so at least I didn't nice. lose everything I did have to sort of <laughs> I did kind of have you to start have to over, work. but not completely. But, but at least you had to, yeah, okay. Well, that, that's, yeah, that, that's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, well, so. Thankfully, you, you did that, yeah. <laughs> um, hey, ADHD can, 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 can be helpful sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. It's, <laughs> it's a, it's a dual-edged sword. Sometimes it's amazing. Yeah. Sometimes I'm staring at the wall for an hour while I try to figure out how to start my day. <laughs> no, exactly. But then you get hyper focus, and then you lose eight hours doing something really well, and then like yeah, oh really? Was that eight hours? Nice. <laughs> and then there's the days that you hyper focus and you lose eight hours doing something that is not necessary in science. No, yeah, exactly. Like I did not need to watch the entire season of that show today, but I, yeah, I spent what we're doing. five hours the other day playing Baldur's Gate two. And I didn't even wow. realize it had been that long. To be fair, though, that was a rest day because I'd come down sick the day before. So I was right. like, I'm just staying in bed and relaxing today. So that wasn't <laughs> such a problem, but it was just like, boop -a doop -a doop -a doop -a doop -a doop Oh, fuck, it's dinner time. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. No, I remember, like, like, the strongest part was, like, I'd be streaming, like, uh, I'd be streaming a game and, like, people would be, like, trying to log off chat and be like, oh, I'll see you later and stuff. I'm like... And I'll be like, oh yeah, I'll be logging off. I'll be ending the stream soon. And then two hours later, I'm still playing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ending the stream soon. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I just don't notice it. Yeah, no, that can be it. And but it can that, be helpful. Yeah, the mm -hmm. the time time dilation essentially in our brains is an interesting thing. Yeah. What we think is ten no, minutes has actually been three hours. <laughs> that happens to me so exactly often. Exactly what we think. What we think is an hour has just been ten minutes. Yes, it sometimes works the reverse way, especially like doing paperwork. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and like, or I've like only been doing this ten minutes. I thought I was done. Right, or like waiting for something to come out of the microwave. Oh yes. I so <laughs> often I'll I'll hit that and I'll have done six things around the house before the microwave finishes. <sighs> <laughs> you know what you mean yeah it's becoming hard it's like okay my grave like let, let's get let's get shit done before yeah. the food is ready that's cool well you might actually like the panel I'm doing for PAX in as well uh, because oh, it's yeah. where myself and a few other neurodiverse folks are getting together and we're doing a panel on 
accessibility and neurodiversity in tabletop gaming. Nice. Um, All right, that'll be fantastic. When when are you doing that panel? Um, we're recording it this weekend, but it's um tenth okay. of September, I think, is the date that it goes live. Because because it packs online this September. year. They're getting all yeah, the panelists to pre-record right. so that there's no latency issues. And then they're getting all panelists to sit in the chat while it's broadcasting on Twitch and answer questions in the chat. So they would respond. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. They, that's they're brilliant. They've got some really good ways of working things for this year um, mm. for PAX Online. Uh, I'll just check. Uh, I'm, I'm, there we go. I'm still amazed at how big PAX has gotten. Like I've been reading Penny Arcade since the really early days. Yeah. Like back when they were only just selling like fruit fucker t-shirts and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went to my first uh, PAX last year. And wow, okay. it was honestly life changing for me. Um, really? I got accepted into the indie tabletop showcase and I took my board game nice. Squirrel Wars down for playtesting. Um, and just actually having a dedicated audience to come and play the damn game while I take notes. And then also meeting all of my peers in the industry that I'd up until then only had online relationships with just right. changed me. I got, you know, seeing everyone and interacting with them properly and seeing all the genuine reactions and being welcomed into the physical community she was just like yes i have made the right decision and <laughs> no absolutely having not a single person walk away from my game bored or upset was reaffirming too i'm like yes i'm almost done then this is good people like it and people were asking when they could buy it and i'm like cool this is good <laughs> <laughs> no, I bet it was incredibly validating just to it, have people like thoroughly enjoy your game. It really was, especially because I've been working on it since 2016. Wow. Okay. But, you know, That's... you know the ADHD oh, yeah. life. I'm obviously working on yeah. many things <laughs> all at once. So it would no, be like, yeah, absolutely. It'd be like it's, three to six the months. Only way. Yeah. It would be three <laughs> to six months between updates on the game. No, that makes sense. Or yeah. then sometimes it would be six updates in three months. Depending on what was going on in my life. Just, or then you'll get a weekend where you just get a lot of stuff done. And that was it. Like the two <laughs> weeks before PAX, I did a massive yeah. overhaul, built a whole new board for it because the board wasn't working for me. And then bam. And like literally on the plane, on the way there figured out a new mechanic with my buddy who was accompanying me to help run the game, <laughs> implemented it over the weekend, and people said that they felt like it had been a part of the game from day one. <laughs> I was like, nice. no, no, I wrote I, the rules I in my that. notebook on the way here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because the game has been in your head the whole time, so yes. it's yeah. sort of a natural progression of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And so I'm really looking forward to the next couple of weeks because I'm finally finished all of the stuff that I was in that, no, you not, uh, I'm not allowed to work on new things until you finish this. So of course <laughs> I was working on other things. Yeah, but... Of course. Cause like, that's when you get all the good ideas. Yeah. When you're about to finish something else. Right. But not as much as I normally would be. Because right. I had that in my head. Like, no, no starting new projects. No working on this big project. You can't rewrite the rules to that game yet. Because you have to finish, finish this, this thing now. first. And I yeah. finished that thing last week. Well, congratulations. There's, I, I was trying to get it finished by January, to be honest. But then COVID stuff mm -hmm. hit. And also, I was yeah. working in hospitality and a couple people quit at the same time. So you had to carry their shifts. Obviously. Yeah, so I had to fill all the sh extra shifts for like two months. So I lost a couple of months worth of work time. And so then I've been no, gradually working on it since then. And uh, another thing you could probably also uh, identify with is the whole... Um, when you feel like you have finished something or like you've finished on a thing and it's no longer a thing that you can make money off, if you're trying to do professional right. stuff, 
but you still need to finish it. But your brain is like, no, no, no. This thing over here, if I finish that next week, I can start selling that straight away. And so it's really hard to reef yourself back over to the thing that, no, this has to be finished first. Right, yeah. Because uh, these were... Especially when there's other stuff that actually get, get you paid. Exactly. Which, which start climbing up the priority list really yeah. fast. Because these were uh, re- bonus rewards for the Indiegogo that right. I did last year. Oh, so okay. we created a, a digital advent- a PDF adventure to go with the player screens I made for ADHD and autism and stuff like that for Dungeons & Dragons. Nice. Nice. Actually... Uh... Oh, this is really cool. Yeah. So I made those for players instead of DMs. Because we'd nice. only just started playing around that point. And I've got ADHD, my partner's got autism and ADHD. We had other players in our group with anxiety and stuff like that. And we were all struggling with remembering the rules as we're learning and trying to play. And we tried some cheat sheets, but they didn't work because object permanence if i don't right yeah yeah like you probably know the feeling of if you put the thing down you don't remember to pick it back up (laughs) no no yeah yeah, exactly and so yeah like like the desk is always a mess because it has to be near me for me to remember it exists yes no i've recently (laughs) overhauled my entire space for that reason like just here is an entire wall of drawers so that everything has its own drawer and I can just lean over, pull it out, grab it, use it, put it back. That's perfect. Where before I had <laughs> my drawers like <laughs> over here in the corner and certain things were sort of mixed in with each other. I'd have to get up, leave the desk, go around there, remember what drawer the thing was in. And so I'd just leave the thing on the desk. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I made those and we did an Indiegogo for yeah, it last year. Great, yeah. Um, and I said yeah, to then they, then you always have the rules in front of you as you play. Exactly. Sort of you, you don't have to well. find something. You don't have to pull the book out. And if your DM familiarizes themselves with the screen, which me being the DM for my group, I knew exactly where everything was because I made it. If someone asks a right, question, yeah, yeah. I can tell them what panel to look at. Nice. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And you're going to talk about that at your panel at PAX. Yeah, it, it will be on the panel as well, yeah, because we're talking about accessibility aids. Um, so right. we've, we've got it split into sections. So there's going to be like an introduction to neurodiversity and, you know, what conditions are neurodiversities and how they affect our brains. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a look at, you know, what is accessibility? You know, behavioral things that are accessibility be- habits. Um actual tools that exist that make games easier to play uh and then the next section is you know ableism what is it what does it look like and sort of addressing it in a way that makes people feel more comfortable talking about it right because a lot of people don't know that certain things are ableism because they don't Mm -hmm. understand what it's like to have a neurodiversity uh, and the key no, example no. for tabletop gaming I use is people getting mad at people for having their phones at the table. How so? Because a lot like, of... Like, why would... Well, uh, some people are like, get off your phone, you're being rude. You know, you're not paying attention to the game, you're not paying attention to everybody else. Whereas people like us, who actually know how our brains work, know that ADHD specifically, in this case, we need to be doing something extra so we can focus on the thing we're doing. So I have a sketchbook at the table right. usually, but some people will have like um, my partner who's got autism and ADHD. So they need to stim mm-hmm. as well as, you know, using that extra energy. Um, they have this little pattern color shifting game. Mm. It's like a little it's diamond, on their phone and phone. you've got yeah. yeah, you've got to shift all the little squares around until you sort out the gradient. And so they'll do that in one hand while they're playing the game, because it one sure, helps get that extra energy out of them. Yeah, yeah, lowers their anxiety by stimming, but also uses that mm. extra secondary focus 
so they can pay attention to what's being said at the table. And, Instead of just completely zoning out. Yeah. Whereas if, if you mm. are just sitting in a silent room at the table, hands clamped, trying to listen, you'll be running away on adventures in your head. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> and so that's my, my, like my go-to example for what minor unintentional ableism can be for neurodiversity. Mm. Because most people won't realize that that's actually an ableist attack. Like, you're not paying I attention. Didn't you know, can't focus. I honestly didn't know that. And because I've slowly been realizing that I definitely have ADHD like a couple of months ago. Like, this is... Yeah. All, like, before that, I just thought this was just how things are. Yeah. So when you're explaining that whole looking at the phone to sort of do the excess energy, like, it makes so much sense. And I did not know that was, that was a thing. Like, it's yeah. a thing that I do, but I did not know that was a thing. Yeah. So that's, like, my go-to example for what um, minor, you know, what people would probably call a microaggression for right. neurodiversity yeah. is. And that mm. just checking in with your player and going, hey... Um, you know, not publicly in front of everybody because mm. that can be embarrassing, but just later be right. like, Hey, um, I noticed you were on your phone a lot at tonight's game. Um, are you doing anything important on there? Are you, are you using it for this? Um, cause I'm not sure if you're catching everything that's happening at the table. Uh, is there something else we can do to help you with that? You know, because yes, yeah, some people are yeah. on Tinder. I've had a player that was just on Tinder the entire time through a game, and until it wouldn't pay attention to the game until it got to his turn. No, oh, yeah, that. Makes and sense. that sucks, especially and when that, I. That is rude. That is rude. Yeah. yeah, especially when I, as the DM with ADHD, am struggling to run the game as it is. Right. Then trying to remember everything that's happened to refresh that player, that's tough. But no, I also play with a lot of other neurodiverse people and I can, I can recognize when they're doing that thing. And I also know that for some of us, depending on what you start doing, you can go down a rabbit hole by accident. Right, and then completely get lost. Yeah, so I try so instead have to have to a sketchbook. control the game to bring them back. Yeah, so instead I have a sketchbook when I'm a player handy. And I'll doodle to do my extra energy thing instead of right, yeah. having a game or reading something. And I find that is the thing as well, is um, reading stuff is a big no-no for me, at least. If I'm reading because something... Because you'll get engrossed with the reading. Yeah, yeah instead of being a secondary focus, it diverts my exactly. primary focus. No, yeah, exactly. So no yeah. scrolling Twitter, basically, while you're playing. Well, that's not as bad, actually. Because it's short form stuff. And I can just like scroll, scroll, scroll. Oh yeah, that's cool. Retweet. Scroll, scroll, scroll. But if I say have like a, a novel or an article or something open, I can right. get completely no, no. lost in that until I finish reading it without realizing. And I don't know that my core focus has been shifted. No, oh, yeah. No, I know. Yeah. Um, and it's not the same for every ADHD person, but it is something that a lot of, I do know a lot of us struggle with is reading something activates the main parts of the brain instead of background processes. Right. And that's kind right, of what yeah, it is. Exactly. It's background processes versus active CPU. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, for, for people that know computers more than me and I think what it, can think of it that way, it's like if you're playing the game, whether that's D&D &D or a board game or whatever, that is your active CPU process. But if that's the only thing an ADHD brain or an autism brain is doing, all the extra you know, background processes will start going off in our head. Whereas if we have right. a, you know, like a secondary window open, drawing on the side, we'll be actively listening while also running a background process, which means that we're running more efficiently. Mm -hmm. which is why i've realized i get i get more work especially with drawing like i would get more work done if i have music or uh like a film or a show playing while i'm doing it bam because yes 
But, like I thought it was like an anti procrastination thing because I would usually procrastinate by watching stuff, and so I'm like, well, it's on, might as well get stuff done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought of it that way, but I never, I never knew it was the actually the extra energy thing. Yeah. Like, whenever something else is on, it sort of blocks out the extra energy so I can focus on the drawing. Exactly, and it's the same for me. Like if I sit down to watch mm-hmm. a movie, I have to grab my sketchbook. Right, yeah. Because no, 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 otherwise no. I can't focus on the movie. Some some movies can like take all my attention, but yeah, then sometimes other movies would just lose me. But yeah. like going to the cinema is difficult. Because I can't oh, I, have to check, I can't no, do no, anything else. Uh, so I'll be there right, watching the yeah. movie and then one suddenly I'll be looking over here at the light on the ceiling going, hmm, they really need to clean that. Oh look. <laughs> There's a cockroach on the floor over there. Wait, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> right, so. I, I, with movies, for me, it's a little different because I really, really love it. Like, when I go into the cinema, like, going to the cinema has been, like, a thing since I was maybe four. So for that, like, I know how to just sit down and just dive into the film. Yeah. And just be part of it. But I could be watching the film and half of my head is sort of somewhere else and then I'll be like, Wait, what just happened? Because I just exactly, I got the... <laughs> exactly, and that's why I I always have my sketchbook or a notebook so I can jot down ideas if I'm thinking about my game or something like that. No, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that that keeps that part busy. No, um, I, know what I mean, especially with the ideas, but like if a movie is really really good, like I would get inspired and I'll be like, I need to write this down before I lose it. Mm-hmm. Yep, that happened in um. My last regular D&D game with my group, actually. Oh, we're, really? We were playing and stuff, and um, we came across a herd of deer. Right. We, were, we knew they were there, and we were going hunting for some food for the caravan that we were with. And then as we approached, there was all the normal deer, and there was a big golden one. Wow, okay. And so some of the caravan decided they wanted to kill that deer, skin it, and sell its pelt, because... They could get a lot of money for that because it's magic and it's gold. Yeah. And so, so our group was like, well, no, that's obviously important. So we're going to go protect it. <laughs> and one right. person who was our hunter slash barbarian was like, okay, well, we still need food. So I'm going to stick here and hunt the regular ass deer. But they're American. So they said ass deer. And the way they said it sounded like the words were, because we were all excited, got strung a little bit closer. So to me, it sounded right. like regular ass deer. And I started snickering like, to right. myself. Like half ass, half deer? Kind of. I started snickering to myself and I pulled out my ta- drawing <laughs> tablet immediately and drew this dodgy cartoon deer with an ass for a face. Nice. <laughs> and I posted that in the chat. It was so fast and so dodgy, and everyone just started <laughs> laughing. And then later that day, I posted it on Twitter, and someone was like, "Oh my god, I need stats." So I'm like, "Oh, okay, okay." So I jumped onto D and D stat block generator and just quickly bashed up right, yeah. uh, a concept stat and threw that on Twitter. And then I was like, the "Other people are all like, yes." Yes, this is amazing. I need more. <laughs> and somebody else made the comment, well, I'd hate to see what an irregular ass deer looks like. <laughs> oh, man. And then I showed my partner that tweet, and they gave me an idea for what an irregular ass deer would look like. And so it has then, since then spiraled into an actual monster supplement that I'm writing with law and stats and a paper mini for each, yeah, for each of the five types of ass deer. Five, oh, you reached five types. In yeah, I stopped. I stopped myself at five. There's the regular right, ass yeah. deer, the irregular ass deer, the giant ass deer, the golden ass deer, and the oh, carnivorous ass course. deer. Oh wow! <laughs> I did not expect carnivorous ass deer. But Have you seen go. Doom Patrol? I have not. No, not yet. 
watch Doom Patrol season one, and you'll you'll know where I'm going with the carnivorous ass deer. All right, fair enough. There's okay. there's a something in that that inspired nice. that specific one. <laughs> That's another one. It's right. like just like Chew, it is bonker balls. It's no. such a good yeah. comic book show. It is really dark, but it also doesn't take itself seriously. And it leans into the crazy. All right. Yeah. So it's it's a really the, enjoyable. The previous watch. DC show, the previous DC show that really leaned into the crazy that I liked uh, was uh, Legends of Tomorrow. Yes, Legends of Tomorrow, I love as well. It leaves, it just really hams it up, and leans into the cheese. It's like we've got, we've got. We've got time travel. We've got superheroes. Let's just right? just fuck it. Let's just do whatever. Like this episode, we're gonna inspire Indiana Jones and Star Wars to, to yep. George Lucas. Um, <laughs> Doom Patrol goes further though, because it unlike nice. Legends, where Legends leans into the ham. Doom Patrol right. was HBO, I think, originally, and then Netflix. No, uh, yeah, it would probably be on Netflix in Australia. I think in America it went to the the whole well it's dead now but like they had this sort of dc streaming no, they've still they've still got they that the harley quinn show, but they're, they're partnered with hbo they did they yeah it's sort of uh, they're shutting it down and they're sending old shows to hbo because it cause this is that all this is all really recent like because uh, warner brothers and at&t sort of finished their merger mm -hmm. yeah i saw they want to they want to build they want to build their whole hbo thing so they're shutting down everything because like a dc streaming service was kind of like i mean i can see merit in that but it's very very niche yeah so it makes sense to sort of integrate integrate it within the it does the HBO thing. but um yeah yeah because they want to was... do the disney thing and yeah then disney already have has their like, sort of marvel star wars national exactly. Geographic and all that under it so yeah it makes sense to put it under there yeah, yeah. but yeah yeah because um doom patrol is hbo not cw they've got yeah. a higher rating so their crazy is less about cheese and just more outright nuts okay like nice I'll, I'll give you a bit of context so you know when it's coming up the thing that's related to the arse deer once you get into the episode mm -hmm. where someone says we mustn't upset the butts <laughs> okay. you're in the right place <laughs> all right sounds good <laughs> and that sort of sets the tone for the show we mustn't upset the right, butts yeah. sets the tone for the show Right, I think that reminds me of this uh, like Dark Souls three enemy, uh, that's basically a hand mm -hmm. with hands and feet, and it and it poops on you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it just <laughs> like it, it's like like the monster is basically just a hand, and there's there's teeth on the fingers. Yeah. And then it has hands and feet, and it crawls. It's it's like a big hairy baby with a hand for a face. <laughs> Wow. Okay. And it poops everywhere, and it that's, poops and poisons. <laughs> that's weird. Yep. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yeah, and like Doom Patrol season, <laughs> I think season one ends with them. But it might the be butts. the start of season. No, no, with season something else. Uh, Sex ghosts. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> All right, I'm expecting a lot of crazy from Doom Patrol. Yeah, you should check it out. <laughs> it's it's. Mm. A lot, but it's really good, and both seasons are out in full. All right, nice. I hope um, they're probably on Netflix. If not, I'll probably just jump. Yeah, on season two is on Netflix. Netflix. I can't remember if number one is. Right. Okay. But season two was released in full I'll, on I'll Netflix. It. It, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be hard to find. Yeah. yeah. V, VPN, I can just go a little trip around the world and find where it's airing pretty much. Yep. All right. Well, it's it's yeah. getting towards eleven thirty now, so she'll probably get ready to wrap up. Yeah. Um, tell us yeah, where everyone can find you. Yeah, my phone is about to die too. So, uh, okay. So I am the only war man on pretty much everything. Uh, so V T H E only, and then war man W A R M A N, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of a play on my name, sort of. So I'm, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitch here as well as the only war man. Uh, on YouTube. Uh, I'm on uh, Peace Cake. Uh, it, that's Peace P E A C E Cake. Yeah. Uh, not P I. Not not like a piece of cake, but just sort of yep. peace and then cake. Uh, 
that's that's sort of the main channel uh it's purely in arabic uh but then i have also another one called uh which is the gaming channel that i'm growing right now right now it's merely let's plays and sort of uh the recordings from the streams yeah but we're building it to have like game reviews and uh like more gaming content pretty much cool cool so these are the two things on youtube and uh I, on instagram i'm the same the only war man uh so you'll find me there uh i haven't launched my comics specific instagram yet because yeah I'm, I'm trying to get back into doing like weekly strips because i've been doing that a long time ago and i've just i've been out of the game so i'm trying to pick it back up so uh once i have that i'll be announcing it on my main instagram which is the only one cool um i will link all of those in the description for youtube as well um for those that are watching on youtube you can look below um final wrap up is that chew is really good for so many reasons it's visually pleasing it subverts and just repurposes a lot of traditional storytelling elements in really interesting ways um it's gorgeous to look at and there is a prequel slash sequel that's just come out uh which is chu not chew um yeah and And there's there's, uh, yes there's the poyo spinoff and also a crossover with outer darkness which is really good as well all right um out of darkness is an out of space sci-fi show where all the spaceships are powered by god engines which are literally captured right. demons and gods <laughs> that wow, okay. fuel their engines so there's a lot of weird yeah. sci-fi supernatural stuff going on as well as space stuff yeah because if you capture a god like might as well use them as fuel for your spaceship right right yeah they they <laughs> The engine is powered by this god, and they just feed it people every so often. Oh. Alright. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. I find that hilarious. Captured enemies after they've interrogated them, feed it to the engine. Feed it to the engine, yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good read as well, actually, Out of Darkness. Mm. Um, and I am Sean Sunday. Those of you that are watching right now on Twitch probably already know who I am, but you can find me under Sean Sunday Art or some variation thereof on most social medias. Um, you will be able to find my Discord in the link below as well. Uh, I also have a channel for Australian illustrators and a channel for Australian RPG creatives as well. Uh, I will link those as well. They're pretty new, but they're going well. Most of the art spaces are sort of US centric, so we decided to create some for those of us working in the industry in Australia to network and help each other develop. Perfect. And um, stay tuned soon for some really exciting D&D news and the PAX panel coming up on the 14th of September. And obviously next week I'll be talking to John Odina or Dino. I'm actually not sure how his last name is pronounced because I've only seen it on Twitter. Uh, about the Inevitables. Well, actually we're talking about either East of West or... Gideon Falls, but we'll also be discussing his comic, which is on Kickstarter right now, The Inevitables. And probably also ranting about some of my favourite punk slash ska bands, because he's got them involved in his comic. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone that's tuned in, and thank you for everyone that is tuning in now on YouTube. I am going to go and edit this and get it uploaded within the hour, hopefully. And um, thank you for joining me this week. It was really cool to have you on. And um, thank you, thank you for having me. You're welcome anytime very, when very we can. Conversation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anytime we can find a comic that we've both read, you're more than welcome back. All right. Well, uh, there's a comic I've been dying to discuss that's pretty recent. It's yeah. also an indie. It's called uh, Money Shot. Tim Seeley. I've been reading that too. Yes. 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 So um, whenever you want to discuss that, I've been trying to discuss that as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I want to try to pick up a couple of the um, paper copies because I've just got the comicsology copies at the moment. Um, yeah. And when I have those, yeah, for sure. All right, absolutely. Okay, uh, this has been No Capes. Stay tuned for next Friday for the next episode. 
Uh, if you're enjoying the format, please let me know if you have any suggestions for the format. Um, I am open to them. Exactly. So, till next time, this has been No Capes. I am Sean Sunday, and thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>